Hello, everyone, and good morning. Uh, thank you very much for being here. My name is Amy Harder. I'm executive editor of Cypher News, where we cover climate technology solutions. I've been covering energy and climate change for the past 15 years, having spent time at Axios and the Wall Street Journal. And you can sign up for our coverage at the QR code right there. I'm really thrilled to be participating in this conversation because building things is going to be at the center of everything that we need to do to address climate change. I traveled the country a lot over the last decade. Covering the oil and natural gas boom, I talked to corporate executives about the potential economic opportunities. But I also talked to residents who had oil wells less than 500 feet from their homes who were concerned about environmental issues and more. Well, we are at the dawn of another energy boom, but this time it's for clean energy. We need to be able to build big projects, to be clear, but at the same time, such an effort must be done in a way that's equitable and incorporates input from communities throughout the entire process, and frankly, before the process even begins. I'm about to share with you a project at Cypher called our Clean Tech Tracker, but first, a very quick backstory. We first got the idea to do this in February 2023, just six months after the Inflation Reduction Act passed. We recognized that we were at the beginning of something very big and that we wanted to track the transforma transformational changes ahead from the very beginning. So we set out to map where in the United States new technologies are taking root and then do the reporting to undercover the why and the what. So in January of this year, we launched the first phase of our map-based tracker focusing on select emerging technologies that are still in their infancy. This includes carbon management, clean hydrogen production, hydrogen elect electrolyzer manufacturing, and sustainable aviation fuel. So here we have the first uh, image of the tracker I want to show you. This is what's currently operating in just those four technology areas. Slim pickings, right? We're getting our data from the Clean Investment Monitor. It's a very comprehensive data project by the Rhodium Group and MIT. If you're super wonky and you really want to dive into all the details and much more, I would encourage you to check out their work as well. Before I go to the next couple of slides, quick raise of hands. Who here lives or knows somebody who lives next to any kind of clean energy development? OK, not many hands. Raise your hand if you know somebody who has had a clean energy developer approach them to have it near where they live. I have. My family's dealing with it as we speak. There might be a solar development on the ranch that I grew up in. So this is what's under construction now. OK, a little more. As a reminder, this is just those four technologies I mentioned. And in a moment, I'll get into why we're focusing on those and not others. OK, that is all the potential. This includes under construction, in operation, but also importantly, everything that has been announced since 2018. And although this is a static image, we encourage you to go to our website for a fully interactive map where you can zoom in and click on each of the projects to get information about the developers, how much the investments are, and much more. Of course, these are just few of the key technologies that we're going to need to tackle climate change. Cypher is initially focused on these four for a couple of reasons. One, we had to narrow our scope somehow to begin, and these are technologies that are critically important to the problem and yet get a little bit less attention than, say, wind and solar farms and electric vehicles. We're doing in-depth reporting on the potential impact that they can have on the local economies and communities, but also global climate change. One example of that, there on the left is a story my colleague recently did, recently did Amina Saeed. Uh, she dug into why most of the big hydrogen, clean hydrogen projects are in Texas. But she didn't just leave it at that. She talked to executives and officials and experts in Texas about what kind of economic impact this could have. She also talked to environmental justice advocates about the concerns of communities that have borne the brunt of a fossil fuel build out and how we can make sure that that doesn't happen with hydrogen, much of which is being proposed by oil and gas companies. 
There on the right is another story that we're pursuing that's publishing tomorrow. So if you want to read it, please sign up uh, for our coverage about why the biofuel sector uh, is low-hanging fruit for carbon capture. You'll notice uh, in the Midwest, you see a lot of green, small green dots. Right there. Why are they all there? What's the, what does that cluster mean? And that those are the type of trends that we're reporting out and that Amina will also be publishing that story tomorrow. Of course, we're just at the beginning of this project, much like we are just at the beginning of this massive clean energy boom. We're some potential growth areas that we're considering. Manufacturing is going to be a big one. Manufacturing of all the clean tech we need. This includes critical minerals, manufacturing of wind and solar, much of which is coming back from places like China because of the IRA, and electric vehicle manufacturing facilities. Long distance transmission lines. We have heard a lot about the challenges of building those and how important they are. We hope to map that somehow as well. But there's challenges in, in, in displaying this because it's such a massive problem and so displaying it um, is naturally difficult as well. We're not including wind and solar because of a very good problem. There's just too much of it now. Uh, but if you want to see that, uh, I would suggest you go to the Clean in Investment Monitor website. Uh, they have a very comprehensive set of this. Long duration energy storage, the technology that will ena enable us to use wind and solar much longer when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining. How to define that so it's over 10 hours versus just under six hours. Those are the types of challenges that we're grappling with as journalists. And importantly, this map only shows commercial scale projects. We've heard a lot about fusion, geothermal, and other really important technologies. Those are not commercial yet, and therefore they're not on our map. That said, maybe it's important that we do show them in some way. And lastly, how should we incorporate canceled projects? That the map I showed you just a moment ago, all of those, not all of those will be built. A lot of them should not be built. We've heard that the IRA might be funding some projects that are not economic otherwise, and perhaps they should not be built. Maybe communities justifiably don't want all of these in their backyards. But again, most of them should be built if we're going to tackle climate change effectively. Ultimately, we want this tracker to be a tool for anybody to learn and use in their own analysis. You can go to our website and freely republish this in your own work. So I want to thank everyone, and I'd like to now introduce Justin Worland, senior correspondent for Time Magazine, whose work I've enjoyed for years. Uh, to introduce the panel. Justin, over to you. There we go. Thank you, Amy. Um, I appreciate the introduction, and I think you did a great job setting the context. Uh, I think, you know, this, this point, we need to build these projects, but also there's a role for communities to play in the discussion. Maybe not all of them need to be built, or, you know, there, in any case, there needs to be community engagement uh, in the ones that are built. So, great way to lay the foundation. We have a great set of panelists here. Um, I'll just go from uh, my left, uh, Catherine coleman Flowers, the cent uh, founder of the Center for Rural Enterprise and Environmental Justice. Um, we have Francesca de Quesada Covey, who is Chief Innovation Officer uh, for Miami-Dade County. And then Wahela uh, Johns, who is Director of U.S. Department of Energy's in, uh, Office of Indian Energy, Office of Indian Energy, excuse me. Um, and then uh, finally, we on the end, we have Shante Harris, who's managing partner uh, at Uonia. Um, I'm going to start with an opening question for all of the panelists, um, just to sort of uh, set the stage for this conversation around community engagement, to ask what does community engagement mean to each of them and their work? Um, and then we'll we'll jump into some more specific questions. But Catherine, maybe we'll start with you. Well, first, first of all, um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I think as we look at community engagement, community engagement means that the people that live in that community from the concept to implementation, and not that someone parachutes into the community with a plan that they've already established and then tried to force it on them. So for authentic community engagement to take place, that means that there have to be representatives, not those that 
but generally happens they go and hand pick somebody that they put on payroll and that's supposed to represent the community. But no, that's not what it is. And I think that we have to recognize the organizations that exist within communities and make sure that they're part of whatever decisions that are made from the beginning to the end. And I, I would just add that you're doing that with, with your organization engaging on, on some of these questions. Yes, we are. We actually co-hosted with the Aspen Institute in October um, a conference in Huntsville, Alabama on authentic community um, engagement as it relates to how do we remove carbon. Uh, and, and those a lot of people are against those projects, but they're against those projects because when they hear about it is when they are announced. <laughs> they're not a part of the, the planning to make sure that their uh, concerns are addressed. So we're really, the, the good thing is that a lot of people are reaching out to us and we hear this more often now. We hear more and more people talking about authentic community engagement. Great. Uh, Francesca, how does community engagement come up in, in your work and what does it mean to you? Um, so good morning, everyone. Welcome to Miami. Um, I am really delighted to be on this panel and I think this panel is such a good example of community engagement where we have a cross representation of both sectors and industries and also um, different people from different areas of the country. So I wanna build off of what you said. It comes from making sure that you are bringing people along in the process. It also comes from trust. And so part of community engagement is spending the time to build that trust. And that means working with government, working with industry, working with nonprofits and working with academics. And I'm really excited in this room, just looking out at some of the community leaders that we have from Miami. We have Galen from government. Um, we have Joanna from the University of Miami. We have Anna from um, industry. So in this room alone, we have that representation of folks that are working with us. That's great. Um, well, Leah. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I come from a really tiny rural community uh, in northeastern Arizona, and I actually got started in energy development um, because there was a huge coal mine in my backyard. Um, and these negotiations happened over 50 years ago before I was born. So um, when it comes to any project development or um, anything that uh, comes into community, I, I think we've learned, our community has learned, um, coming from uh, you know, a rural area, is that uh, we want to make sure that uh, anything that's proposed, uh, that we're at the table and that we're in discussion before it's even like a concept. Um, I think we have to go a step back and really empower uh, communities in such rural areas, but also where English is a second language, that's where the community I come from, um, that they have all the necessary tools to make a decision um, before a developer comes into their community. And I think this is the empowerment piece that is um, definitely with government. We are trying to make um, things uh, more accessible for communities. Um, a lot of our uh, current grant opportunities through Bill and Ira, but also um, funding opportunities, we incorporate community benefits. 20% um, of applications that are submitted, they have to, with its industry developers, um, have to state you know, what, what's their engagement plan with community if they're proposing something in a certain region. Uh, and so there's a lot there. Uh, it can go from you know local workforce, um, building a local workforce. It could go to supporting um, maybe a community college or schools, um, but also it could you know try to figure out how to support communities having and being um, partner in the project and receive benefits. So yeah, I think um, for our office, we work with 574 fairly recognized tribes, and that's a huge um, portfolio, and so we have a trust responsibility to tribes. Um, and this, you know, we have treaties that go back many years ago, and we have to uphold those treaties. Um, and they're actually older than state formation, so, um, and tribes look at these treaties as the law of the land. So we also have that kind of trust responsibility that, um, we have to incorporate in the ways that we are doing engagement. Great, a lot of threads to pull on in, in, in that. Shante? 
Yeah, hi, my name is Shante Harris. I'm the founder and managing partner of Unoya. I know it's pretty hard to say if you haven't heard it before, but it means beautiful thinking in Greek. And I actually announced it last week, but I've been building it for about a year and a half. Uh, my background is as a climate tech operator, investor, and ecosystem builder. I spent about four and a half years actually scaling different technologies in companies across various stages. So everyone from the largest fleet manufacturer in the world for EVs to leading uh, and growing startups across waste, buildings, carbon management, you name it. And so when I think about community engagement, I really think about strategy. And what does it look like for us to really take the onus off of communities to do all of the work when we're thinking about deployment? Not only because that's unfair, and I know the future that I want to live in, I think many of you are here because you would agree with this, is not just how do we scale these technologies, but also how do we improve the communities around them that are ultimately not just people responding to projects and technologies, they're also customers. So when I think about community engagement, I've seen both sides of the coin where we have founders and companies that understand that and actually build that into their R&D process. And then they're a lot more equipped prior to even going to a community and launching a project to understand those needs because they've actually baked it into strategy. And so I think really what I hope we get to talk about today, and I'm really appreciative of the other panelists for bringing this into the conversation, is what does community engagement actually look like when we're equipping founders and operators alongside communities to build projects together, and that is a capacity question. So how do we start to talk about capacity building on both ends so that we have better shared outcomes, and that's really what is at the heart of Unoya, and so we build tools, and I'll get into that a little later, but I'm excited about what I'm seeing in the space because we're no longer talking about what hasn't worked. Yes, we have to talk about what hasn't worked. I think many industry leaders, and I know because I've sat in rooms with them, would say we have not done this well. So part of this is acknowledging that because we haven't done it well, we don't know all the answers. So we have to test things. We have to try things. We have to learn from them. We have to iterate upon them and then also share blueprints, right? So moving forward, communities are actually a part of the process. And when I say a part of the process, I don't mean just at the table or at a community me uh, meeting. I also mean shared ownership. And what does it look like for us to actually reimagine the way that we're thinking about revenue models and revenue sharing because ultimately what we're seeing is that actually is helping projects succeed and there's more than enough in this trillion dollar economy to do it that way and so I'm hopeful by the founders that I've worked with over the past few years who started doing this at the R&D stage and so hopefully what we'll see in the next few years are some really great use cases of what this actually looks like and not just hey that didn't work or you all didn't think about this community of course, we'll have those conversations as well, but how do we also create dialogue that's just as intentional and impactful on the other side? Well, I love that, and maybe let's just start there. I mean, I think there's, um, you know, for a long time, community engagement, particularly around projects, has looked like, you know, uh, developers coming and saying there are going to be jobs, there's going to be local economic development. That sometimes comes, it sometimes doesn't. Shantae, what you're talking about is, is you know building wealth, creating revenue in these communities. What what does that look like? How does that actually happen? And maybe start with you, and I'd love to get some other thoughts. Sure. Um, I mean, I don't have all the answers. I think no one does. But what I will say is that what we know is that most climate tech companies have a hardware or physical product component. And so what that means is not only do they need more money because they're oftentimes more capital intensive, it also means that the returns, the potential for the returns are really huge. And I think this is important to note because yesterday I sat in on a panel, I don't know if any of you were there as well, about uh, climate projects meeting private capital. And I, what I find so interesting in most of those conversations is how little we talk about about community as really an asset for all of this. It's often seen as like, oh, we have to you know, be responsive to the community or ultimately think about it on the back end. But actually, there are many communities who have been asking for projects for decades because they're also the same communities that have been harmed by incumbent industries. And so I think when we start to look at it that way, and I know many companies are, it really presents this really great opportunity, not just for, hey, how do we get these projects out onto the, out onto the ground, but also what does it look like for the company to 
be able to scale faster and to accelerate its deployment. Like we're talking about a need, a shared need oftentimes between community and companies. Does that mean they're always going to align? Absolutely not. Are certain aspects or categories of climate technologies more, you know, uh, challenging than others, 100%. But I think when we start to talk about what shared ownership can look like, what economic development looks like, it looks like actually looking at what's happening around the community. So one of the things that I worked on this past year with a consortium of catalytic funders is how do we actually do a pre-assessment before we propose a project? And when I say we, I'm talking about funders, financiers, as well as founders, and ask questions around what is the existing economic makeup of that community? So, I mean, I'll say it out loud now, it feels kind of common sense, but it's not happening. The reality is that people are proposing projects and not even looking at what are the socioeconomic factors around that project. So like, has there been other developments in that space? Do people have access to housing? Is the education system good? And all of this matters because then when you go to a community you know, engagement meeting for the first time and you know absolutely nothing about the community outside of just your project and you expect support, it's, it doesn't work that way, right? And so I think that's kind of step one. And then we can start to get into step two of like, okay, well, if we're moving past just engaging with communities on a one-off basis and we actually take the time to diligence and analyze this stuff, which quite frankly is not long. I know because I've done it. It doesn't take that long. It's just a matter of whether or not we're actually baking it into the strategy. And ultimately, operators and founders need support doing that. And I do think this is a funder and an investor conversation. So if there are funders and investors in the, conver in the conversation, what we're talking about is can we accelerate deployment for your existing portfolio? I'm not saying that's the only way I think about it or that's the only reason why I care, but I think if we're talking about this constant stakeholder management that companies are doing where they're under the pressure of scaling, we also have to acknowledge that investors and funders have to be just as invested in these conversations as they are in the returns discussions because they're so interconnected. So. I'll, I'll pause there, but I just wanted to name that because I think before we even get to revenue or you know shared community models, we actually have to completely shift the way that we're engaging and ultimately addressing communities from the beginning. Well, I think a lot of great points in there, and I'll just I'll just underscore. I mean, there's a 2022 study that showed that 30% of project failures had a lack of community engagement, and you know if you're thinking about making a successful investment, you know. Engaging the community is actually a, a, an important factor. I, Catherine, I just want to give you an opportunity to come in here if, if you'd like. This is a big conversation at the Huntsville Forum that you referenced. Um, I don't know if you have, have thoughts. Yes, I do have thoughts. Um, I've just seen it. You know, I've seen where uh, when people come in, they don't engage the community. Uh, they basically find the landowner. Uh, let's let's use Cancer Alley for an example. You know, if you look at Cancer Alley, uh, I just remember when I went there on to to visit people in the community, and I was with General Russell Honore. And when General Honore took me there, um, we went to he he was giving us the history of the lay of the land, and the lay of the land was uh, the people that had owned the property were once plantation owners. So these were their descendants. And most of them were absentee landowners. They didn't even live there. So, and then as he started pointing out all these multinational corporations that were there polluting the community, those multinational corporations, most of them were not even US owned companies. And they had not engaged with the local community. And it, it, it sets up a paradigm that I've seen over, played out over and over and over again. If you also go to Africatown in Alabama, you'll see the same thing. That the people that own the land, uh, the ones that actually brought the person, the, the family who was responsible for the ship, that actually brought the, the people from Africa to Alabama, are the same ones that still own the land today. And they have sold this land to dirty plants that surround where, where the descendants of that slave ship live today. So that's an economic paradigm that keeps playing out over and over and over again. Well, the other part of it is, go to Athens, Alabama, which is not far from where I live. In Athens, Alabama, they brought in this major uh, truck stop that's from Texas. I won't say the name, but everybody knows it because of the beaver. 
But anyway, <laughs> anyway, what they did was the black community there has been asking for infrastructure. They want to get off septic tanks, uh, and they want to be part of the city sewer system for years. But yet, what do they do? And I've seen it over and over again. They ran it around them to the industry, and they are still on septic tanks asking for some type of relief. That's because there's no real community engagement. What would it look like if when the beaver decides to go to another community, that they also do the assessment that Shantae talked about, and they figure out, well, to, in order to get to us, they got to bypass this community that's been without sewer for years and have been asking for it. What if they became advocates along with the community? Isn't that a good way to build trust? I mean, that's the shift that needs to happen so we can have the kind of engagement that doesn't keep perpetuating these inequities that occur in marginalized communities around the country. That's great, great, great way to make that concrete. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit. Uh, this came up in uh, both Walea's uh, opening remarks and then in Shantae, what you were saying, just about educating communities uh, from the get-go, uh, engaging with communities from before the you know particular project even comes up. And I know this is a big focus uh, for your office, Walea. I, I wondered if you could talk about the, the role that education, technical assistance, et cetera, plays um, even before we're talking about you know concrete projects and, and how you think about that. Sure. So we, our office offers technical assistance at no cost for tribes. And, um, you know, tribes come to us to ask, you know, maybe they're thinking about strategic energy plan. And so we help to assist with that. Um, really, we're trying to meet tribes where they're at in their energy journey. Um, I also just want to recognize, too, that, you know, this comments around um, big, the history of energy development in the United States. Um, in mostly disadvantaged communities, um, indigenous communities, tribal communities, have bared the brunt of the pollution and the legacy issues that many industries have not cleaned up yet. So you have a distrust from communities and you have from tribes as well in going into this kind of clean energy revolution. You know, what? how are we designing a model that can reflect, um, I guess, learning from, you know, the past hundred years of energy development in this country and creating practices that uh, fit in line with the values of community and tribes. And I think, you know, with tribes, they understand the land in this country the most, and they have given up um, a lot of the land and ceded a lot of territory to make way for um, what's here in the United States. And there's commitments, again, back to the treaties and back to our um, as federal agencies to make sure that we um, are caretaking of those relationships. Um, and it, today, we still have a lot of homes, Native American homes that don't have access to electricity. Uh, where I come from, big coal mining community, powered all of the West for 50 years. Yet, over the hill from the industry, thousands of homes still don't have electricity. Thousands of families still haul water and unpaved roads. Um, and so you hear about this in Appalachia, you hear about this in many parts of the US, and I think, um, you know, what I, when I, we get developers coming to us all the time and they ask us, how, can you introduce us to a tribe? Can you, you know, and I said, and, and states too, states are the same way, you know, I'd say, you, you gotta go, uh, you know, you might make a mistake, but introduce yourself to them, you know, learn about them before you introduce yourself to them understand where they're coming from and um, because that history is really a big part of um, the journey, I think, in the way that we're going to create a model that is collaborative, that is in the best interest of what communities want to see. If they want electricity in a, and, and maybe use solar, battery storage, I don't know. And I think that we really got to meet communities where they're at. Um, we've done over 400 technical assistance requests with tribes, uh, we've supported over 200 mostly clean energy projects, solar, wind, battery storage, and tribes are have been doing this for over 10 years. They have, uh, I think, have been the leaders in this country 
doing it to prepare their community in case of, our, I guess, weathering the climate. Um, many of these tribes have faced flooding, uh, wildfires, and have created these uh, energy systems with backup power to sustain critical health facilities, um, uh, tribal buildings. And I think, you know, we can learn a lot from tribes and it's a matter of really uplifting their stories. We have a tribe here in Florida, Seminole Tribe of Florida, that is demonstrating being a leader in clean energy. Are they here in this space? You know, they're very close to here, but we've supported them. And I think that's part of, um, you know, the way that we're gonna understand and learn and the way that we're gonna, I mean, we have to uplift these amazing successes that, uh, you know, what tribes have been uh, accomplishing. And um, because I, I wanna go to the indigenous knowledge they carry, um, you know, much of the biodiversity globally, if you don't know, 80% of it is on or near indigenous people's land. And so if we are really serious about solving the climate crisis, we have to make those investments and partnerships with tribes and indigenous peoples globally. Um, and I think that's true here in the US as well. And um, Indian country needs a lot more support and investment. So I think it's definitely, um, yeah, there's a huge energy burden that I won't go into, but we just did a report in Indian country still. And so while we're thinking about big projects, we also have to consider the, um, I guess the history and practices that we want to avoid. Because I know we wanna move fast and go big, but there's something beautiful about the small and you know the slow, kind of slower process that we've seen tribes actually practice and it works. So. Well. I hopefully we'll have time to come back to that. I think it's such an interesting point to think about tribal knowledge, which to your point often gets talked about in a in a biodiversity context, but thinking about how that how that applies to the energy system and, and hopefully we'll have a chance to get back to it. But Francesca, I want to I want to come to you. Um, a lot of, of your work thinks about uh, how do you actually take new technologies, new solutions and make sure that the community is communities are benefiting from from those. And I just wondered if you could talk a bit about that, it's a little bit of a different um, um, perspective or pr different approach than perhaps what we've been talking about. So in a lot of this conversation, we've been talking about how do you um, respond to communities that haven't been at the table. And what we do in the Office of Innovation and Economic Development is think about how do we incorporate what people need from the beginning. And I'm purposefully using the word people, not communities, because communities can feel hard to understand, they can feel big, and they can f they're can they defined differently by every person. I am sure that if you went down this panel and you said, can you define community, we would all have slightly different variations of community. So what we focus on is the people that are within communities, and we wanna do two big things, which is one, sustain economic growth for those people um, in Miami-Dade County, and we wanna make sure that we are also thinking about improving the quality of life for those people. So we look at everything that we are building with those two metrics as our North Star. And what we do is make sure that across the different verticals that we are focused on, that we ask those questions first. So we don't engage in any project if we don't ask, how is this going to improve and sustain economic growth? And how is this going to improve quality of life for the people that we are trying to serve? And when it comes to climate, we're really, really proud to be the only designated climate tech hub in the United States. We were designated by the Department of Commerce. Um, and we use those two questions to frame that conversation and to make sure that we were bringing in community members to be a part of that. So in our climate tech hub, we have over 70 people that get to get 70 organizations that get together every single week. Industry is represented, academics are represented. Um, the nonprofit sector is represented. The Seminole and Miccosukee tribes are represented. Um, we are working with the um, only historically black college and university in South Florida. Um, we are working 
with underserved communities purposefully to make sure that they're at the table and they have a voice. The Alapata CDC, which serves a largely immigrant population, um, is making sure that they are doing um, technical assistance and community building. And the reason that that is the way that we start and have those two areas as our focus areas is because Miami-Dade County, um, for those, how many of you are from Miami? Okay, so not a lot. So um, Miami, just a quick sort of where we are. Miami-Dade County is the county that you're sitting in. You are in the city of Miami Beach, which is one of 34 municipalities within Miami-Dade County. When you think of Miami, you probably think about the beach here and you probably call that Miami. And if you think about the city of Miami, you're thinking about the big buildings that you saw when you um, flew in, but those are two separate cities. And I work for Miami-Dade County and Mayor Levine Cava, who is the mayor that organizes and coordinates those 34 municipalities. She's also responsible for the airport, the seaport, the roads, and there are areas of unincorporated Miami-Dade. We are 2.7, 2.8 million people. If we were a state, our GDP would be 14th. And of those people, 70% are either first generation or immigrant. And so we need to make sure that we are constantly hearing from different people and different areas of the community because our population is constantly shape, shape shifting. And so we need to be incorporating what their views and them into the conversations in order for us to meet our goals of, again, economic growth and sustainability and improving the quality of life of our residents. Well, I, I want to connect, um, you know, you're, you're working with, uh, with companies, with, with, uh, with industry, um, and we're, we've been talking, Shante mentioned, you know, needing to get them on board, thinking about communities, and, and you're helping facilitate that. I, I guess I'm just curious, you know, what sort of level of understanding and awareness are you seeing with industry? Is that changing? Is there a newfound understanding of the need to engage communities? What, what, are, what are you seeing in your experience? So when it comes to climate or just broadly? Well, I think, I, th I think you know, talking about climate and communities, but uh, particularly, I mean, it, it's applicable still if it's about community engagement on, on economy as well. So, I mean, it'd be great if it connected to climate, but I'm, I'm curious the context as well, the broader context. So one of the things that I'm seeing with industry is that the green premium is decreasing s significantly. And so we're finding more commercial opportunities for consumer technology. And so industry is responding to communities and people because they are building products for those communities and people. So it used to be that when you had, and, and this sort of exists in every new market, when you're thinking about a new market, the first place, and before working at the county, I was um, in venture for the last two years. And when you think about a new industry, you normally go to large existing players that are gonna give you large contracts so that you can start further commercializing and create a really strong sales cycle. So if you think about AI, for example, you go to the Fortune 100 and you go to government. And that exists in every industry. What we're seeing in climate is because the climate industry is a little bit more developed than it was 10 years ago, we're moving towards more consumer products. And so because industry is building for consumers, they are actively engaging the community. And the reason that they are building for consumers is the green premium is going down. Climate technology is lowering costs. It's increasing efficiency. And it is improving the way that people are interacting where they're changing relationship with water, heat, wind, and humidity as the planet is changing. And so we are seeing that community is responding, but it's also that the community is demanding of industry something different. So, you know, in this, in this conversation, we have been talking about how we reach out to community, but one of the things that I think was really, really fascinating about what you said is also how does community engage? And so when you were talking about treaties that are older than states, right? And they're saying, no, 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 this is here. Community also has a responsibility and an opportunity to be at the table and set the tone and the agenda. That's, yeah, it's great, a great point. So community voices can shape what, what, what industry does. Um, Shante, I, I don't know if you have uh, any thoughts on that sort of same question, given your 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 uh, VC um, background. Yeah, I think I would agree with some of the consumer um, opportunity, but I'd also 
expand that to say that it's also B2B. Like there are so many, com- I mean, we think about a company, they have supply chain, they have logistics. I was working with a corporate, a big corporate two years ago who understands water scarcity, right? And how water is pretty much the only way that they're going to continue to make money long term. So yes, there's an angle on consumer when you think about the products, I won't say which corporate this was, but the products are mainly to consumer. But then they're also most of their vendors in the in the supply chain or in the logistics side of things. It, they're not part of the company, right? They're their suppliers and they all have facilities and projects all over the world. And so I think what we're seeing even at a, a larger commercialization piece is corporates are really understanding, hey, we have to think about all of the communities that already existed around the facilities. So the harm that happened before that we have not been transparent about or still aren't talking about, right? And so this isn't just about new projects. This is also about, hey, many of these these existing facilities are actually being upgraded with energy efficiency solutions and technologies. Many of them rely on the surrounding environment, which includes people. And so how are we starting to actually merge our discussions around social impact and community engagement into our asset management, right? The physical assets that we own all over the world, our suppliers that are involved in it. So it's honestly, in my opinion, a lot bigger than consumers. It's also that B2B angle and also business to government, which I think we don't talk about as much in the startup world. But I mean, I worked with large corporates. Their biggest customer was government. I think many of you, if you work in business, you know that. And so what Inflation Reduction Act has unlocked is all of these dollars around J40 that you can't access unless you're doing this work. So I think we're seeing it from all of these different market drivers, whether it's policy, consumer behavior and demand, and ultimately communities are people, right? So they're a part of all of these. They may already be working at a facility where their 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 family is harmed, right? Whether that's higher asthma rates or exposure to pollution, that didn't change just because now we're talking about the energy transition. And so I think the part of like, how are we incorporating this into strategy doesn't just mean, hey, we launched this great new project. It's good for the community. It's, well, what are all of the projects that we launched in the past that were also harmful, which, yeah, is uncomfortable, but that's the reality of it. And I think if we can get past the discomfort, we can also talk about all of the incredible opportunity that lies there to say, hey, how do we actually build new relationships with community and build new trust? And I won't get into case studies around this, but there are some really great companies already doing that. If you haven't heard of a startup called Pangaea, their material science company, I am so impressed with how from the very beginning they've been thinking about their supply chain, their logistics, and ultimately all of the corporate partners that they serve and actually demanding more of their suppliers and their workers. There's another incredible ocean CDR company named Vesta. They did a great pilot in the Dominican Republic where they did all of the stuff from the very beginning. So there are use cases. I think we have to start really talking about them, seeing them as blueprints and asking questions about how do we continue to improve them and they're not going in and saying hey we're doing this project they're they're actually hiring scientists and researchers and also local champions that then communicate to them after they've done that first pre-assessment that I've talked about and integrating that into a holistic strategy. So I think we're seeing this not just on the startup side, but startup can drive larger commercialization adoption. But we're also seeing this at the corporate side where they don't know. And we know they don't know because Deloitte has a whole practice around this now. So it's it's real, right? So it sounds like it, you do see it it's, it's caught on. I mean, it's catching on. Maybe it's early stage, but it's catching on. Yeah. Yeah. And I wouldn't even say it's early stage. I mean, yeah, I, I, I can count on, on in the past year, like 20 teams that I've spoken to and huge corporates that have hired people specifically for these roles. So I think it is catching on. I mean, you don't get the funding and J40, it's 40%. You don't access that if you don't do this work. So startups understand that, corporates understand that, and I think most importantly, communities understand that. Communities are expecting more and they actually have real leverage, which I think was the whole point of the J40 dollars, right? It's about making those drivers on on all ends. And let's just just to uh, make sure everybody, I mean, I'm sure most people here know what J40 is, but Justice 40, the the executive order from uh, President Biden, uh, requiring the benefits from the federal infrastructure spending to benefit communities. Um, okay, we're going to go to questions. Um, so does anybody have a question? Okay. 
Maybe, maybe we'll take two at a time, and I'll just go with the two in the back right there that are right next to each other. Hi, I'm uh, Marissa Zuzalak, and I work for FEMA. And this is um, to Ms. Johns, but anyone can really answer it. Um, we're currently trying to implement net zero energy projects. Um, and you referenced your technical assistance. Um, I was wondering if you could expand on that. And is it just for DOE grants, or would it also encompass other grants um, so that we can reference it to our implementers on the ground? Sure. Uh, it, let's, let's just take one more question so we can get as many, and then we'll, we'll take your answers. Sorry. Hi, I'm Josh Garrett. I'm a founder of Redwood Climate Communications. Um, this is a great discussion about effectively engaging with communities directly, you know, between investors, project developers, et cetera. I'm wondering if you have, have you seen in your work recently, and if so, how do you address um, misinformation? So coordinated attempts to block clean energy and other products, uh, projects coming from often shady uh, powers, but often somewhat obviously connected to oil and gas or other corporate interests that have bigger plans to try to stop or slow down the energy transition? Great question. OK. Do you want to start, Willia? Sure. Um, so we have a tribal resource guide. I can send you the information. But um, we came out with that a couple weeks ago, sort of directs tribes on where they're going uh, as far as they're, where they're at in their energy planning. Um, and our office will be also taking the lead on sort of being the tribal. We are kind of the tribal front door for DOE. Um, so if you have any specific questions, please contact me. And then our, de our deputy director for our office is here, David Conrad, as well. So if you all have more questions around our office, um, please talk to him as well. Um, yeah, I think on the... Um, we, we're seeing a growing trend to your question around um, tribes being uh, careful on these projects that are being cited maybe near their lands or on their lands. And we have been creating guidance around um, making sure developers and um, are working in partnership with tribes or even just identifying where these lands are, if it's tribal lands, that they need to um, work with tribes or they need to, you know, uh, yeah, so that's been really challenging. I'm seeing that trend happen and with transmission lines, um, a lot of concerns with um, mining development throughout the country. Um, and again, many of these uh, minerals are located near or on indigenous lands. So um, we are working to tr try to support um, guidance, not just in, within our agency, but other agencies. In the state of Florida, we're having a lot of um, feedback from the state about what language should and shouldn't be used. <laughs> so you're smiling and nodding, so you understand what I'm saying. Um, and what we, the way that we talk about it in Miami-Dade County is, one, we do talk about climate. Um, and two, we want to make sure that we are communicating with our audience and so what our audience is seeing is increased flooding, more and more hot days, more humidity, more wind, and more extreme weather with insurance prices that are going up. And so the more that we can make it concrete to the lives that people are living, the easier we are able to take the conversation from the the bigger, more esoteric terms that can be controversial to the ones that really resonate deeply with people. Because if you ask anyone in Miami-Dade County whether over the last 10 years they have seen more incidences of flooding that has affected their day-to-day -day life, they will say yes. If you ask anyone in Miami whether the storms are getting you know, heavier and causing more issues, they will say yes. If you ask anyone in Miami if it's getting hotter, they will say yes. So how do you make sure that it resonates with people in a way that they understand it from their day to day and not get into the um, the discussion on certain words that are allowed or not allowed? Great. Okay. Um, I guess we'll go. I'll take I'll take these two and then I yeah I'll take these two. Let's just start there. I get so eager to make sure everybody gets a chance and then. 
Hi, I'm Kira Owensby. I am currently a PhD student at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville and also one of the future climate leaders. So over the past couple of days at the Future Leader Climate Summit portion of this festival, we've been talking a lot about like environmental justice. And as part of that, at least as younger people, we've been talking about getting caught up in the analysis paralysis of making sure that you're not doing any harm like at all, but that kind of stifling the progress of like attempting to implement something. So do you all have any suggestions on kind of finding the balance between these two issues and making sure that we are able to continue making progress, especially with everything that needs to be done in such a short amount of time, but still minimizing the harm that could be done. Love that question. Let's get one more and then we'll, we'll go. Hi, my name is Estra Kuchukchivchi. I'm the founder of Pricing Innovations. You all alluded to this um, two-part question. You mentioned um, the communities have the tools to make the decisions for themselves. Do you have a few examples of that and what type of data um, do they seek uh, in part of making those decisions? And second part is, what are some of the metrics that you measure or track to communicate the benefits of these projects to the communities in the long run? Thank you. Do you want to start, Catherine? Yes. Uh, I think the elephant in the room is that you know, we have an economy that's built on a plantation system. And until we change that, we're going to have, I know I'm in Florida, but I'm going to say this, we're going to have more inequality. And in order to move away from that, we're going to have to change our economic paradigm. And our economic paradigm is set up to benefit the people that already have and to only work the people that don't have and not pay them for their labor. And I, I'm saying this as a descendant of slaves, you know, in this state, I'm sure you're taught about the benefits of slavery. But what we're talking about on this stage is, is how we don't have benefits, and we've continued this through other forms to do the same thing over and over and over again. And the only way we're going to change this is acknowledge it. And we can't, I, I understand communities that have suffered for years not want to be, uh, not want to continue and pass on to generations after us the same things based on these failed economic paradigms. So consequently, while we're talking, uh, we need to change this. Otherwise, do we put a solar panel on a trailer? Doing climate change. I live in an area where there's extreme weather. We have more deaths in the state of Alabama from tornadoes because people live in trailers. So are we gonna just try to have this clean energy transition so fast that we're gonna put solar panels on top of trailers, but we're not gonna put people in homes that are resilient. So we have to figure out a way, and I think young people are gonna have to help us do this, to get us out of this box that we put ourselves in, a way in which we can do both, we have to do both. Otherwise, we're having more inequality. And poor people are still gonna be on the front lines of this suffering and a few people will benefit from it. So we have to shift those paradigms. And I think that the discussion should be, how do we change this paradigm? If we can figure that out, I think that there won't be as much paralysis because people are scared that we're gonna keep doing the same old thing and they're gonna be left out of the equation and there will not be a just transition. Very well put. <laughs> um, does, some, does someone want to take the question on metrics? How do we measure the benefits here? Yeah, Shante. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, well, we don't right now. So <laughs> I think we have to start. Um, and I've worked on the industry and obviously the tech side. So uh, one of the tools that Unoya is launching actually in the next couple months that we've been testing is essentially a new science and assessment framework that actually gets at the heart of all of the technology level readiness levels for right emerging climate solutions and layers that with environmental justice science, system science, and how do you start to really integrate that into the development? Not because you won't have any harms. I think we have to be honest here. 
I mean, we wake up every day and make harmful decisions. That's the reality of it. It's not just about, hey, how do we not have any harms? It's really about, I think, shared risk and shared benefit. I think everything that we've been saying, and, and thank you, Catherine, for your incredible words, is the reality is it hasn't been shared. All the risk has gone in specific communities and specific areas. And so when we talk about risk, the question is, well, who is it risky for? And I think we start to have those questions, especially in developing technologies, projects, all of these things, then you can actually start to get at, well, what do shared benefits mean? Right, And I think shared benefits goes back to revenue, goes back to community stake, all of these things. But until we start to ask the right questions and research and design things differently, we're going to keep creating the same harms because we know that it's not working. And the last thing I'll say on that is we tested this recently with a big university. And I was wowed by the number of incredible directors on that call that were like, hey, we've never done this in our research. Like we've never thought about these things holistically. And so uh, the name of the tool is called climate tech system science readiness and it aims to be a mirror of technology level readiness and actually start to create those tools so that we can move past that paralysis to what are we building how are we designing it who's involved in it who's not involved in it so that we have better outcomes right so in 10 years we're not sitting in the same room wondering why our projects and our technologies are creating harm significant harm in the same areas and communities and regions that it has been before and that ideally we've actually decreased the harm and actually created sh more shared benefits because we ask these questions in thoughtful ways. I, I do think that there are some metrics that we can look at when it comes to community levels and building from the product perspective. It is your tool sounds amazing and I can't wait to play with it. Um, if you wouldn't mind giving us access with Miami Dade, we'd love to. And um, we are always looking for new data tools. Um, but to, to the point that Catherine was making, it is about asking questions that have fundamentally not been asked since that has that I've never been asked, which is how many people are being employed? How are their salaries going up? How many people are making sure that have access to electricity? How are we making sure how many people are being hospitalized because their working conditions are leaving them dehydrated and suffering from heat stroke? What are the health impacts here? How many people, how many kids are missing school because they don't have access to transportation or because it was, there was too much flooding? So there are definitely metrics that we need to improve, but on a community and person basis, there are metrics that we need to be tracking year over year, particularly for communities where we haven't tracked them to make sure that these benefits are passing down. And where we are seeing communities where the overall unemployment rate in a, a city or in a county is at three or 4% and where communities have unemployment rates in the tens, in the 10 digits, we have a problem. And we need to make sure that as we are thinking about more technology and greater economic opportunity, that we are really tracking those metrics and ensuring that those jobs are going to those communities. Also, I did want to mention, because I think it's really important, RMI put out a case study recently of failed projects and also what communities asked for, and they have a list of what are the top asks of communities based off of their experiences. I'm not saying it's the end-all, be-all, but it's a great place to start. And actually, from what I recall, one of the top requests was affordable housing. So I know that's come up multiple times, but housing. <laughs> you know, like, it's great that there's a solar project, but if people don't have places to live, right? Great, we have time for one more question. Um, I'm gonna go right here since I haven't gone to the side. Um, do we have a mic? Um, and we only have time for one more, sorry. Yes, I, I think this is an important conversation. And I, I come from a community that's right next to a big garbage incinerator. <laughs> Right, so I've been worried, you know, as we're talking about clean energy tech and how everything's just getting mixed in. And I'm hearing from the government a lot, well, we wanna be technology neutral, see what rises up. But, you know, when I see garbage incineration become renewable energy, <laughs> we had to fight off a sludge plant that was just gonna burn human waste to make low carbon concrete, <laughs> right? So I'm worried about the, you know, the ca kind of capture, the industry capture of a lot of the clean tech. And so how do you make sure that, you know, that line's being drawn, that we're not just like, okay, spaghetti at the wall, let's see what sticks. 
and we don't <laughs> let fossil fuels kind of guide us by the nose with a lot of the carbon capture. I mean, now it's carbon management, right? And say, we can exist for another 30 years, just let us pretend that we're going to put carbon back in the ground and nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to happen at all drinking water, <laughs> right? Like a lot of things that our communities are obviously worried about. And I see hydrogen up here, but it's limited and doesn't, you know, it's not limited to just green hydrogen. It also includes hydrogen made from fossil fuels. So I'm seeing the conversation just be convoluted. So how do you get that clarity and make sure that communities are protected? Because otherwise we're not going to buy in and we're going to dig it. We're going to have to dig in to protect ourselves. So I, I think it's a very interesting question. I mean, particularly, you know, fossil fuel industry is taking the lead on a lot of these these new projects. And there's a question of trust. Um, how can you trust an industry after, you know, um, um, all of the, the, the problems that they've caused? So I, I don't know. We have really just a, no time remaining. So if somebody want to answer this very quickly. Um, well, it's definitely not a quick answer, yeah, I, so I'm happy I, I to chat that. with you further. It's a really important question. It's one that I've thought a lot about in the tech and the investment world. I think there's not enough people thinking about it, and I think it goes back to, like, what are we solving for, right? Like, are we solving just for an energy transition, or are we solving for all of these challenges that are a part of that, right? And I think that gets, what you said gets to the heart of why, you know, teams building with community and also, quite frankly, in a diversity context. Like, I love my engineers. I love my scientists. They probably know nothing about what you just said, and they're the one building our technologies. That doesn't make them bad people, but I do think that puts the onus, for example, on universities to really, really invest in this stuff alongside the science and the engineering. I think if we really start to do that, we'll also start to see companies where you don't have to wait until they're deploying to ask those questions. They'll have already done that. And so we're not saying, oh, well, how can you lessen your harm? It's like, oh, well, actually you could have maybe made a better more innovative product that got to the heart of that if you ask these questions at the R&D stage I think that's what I'm excited about is there enough of that happening no I hope that my tool helps create more of that but that to me is really at the heart of what are we solving for is it just to move out concrete or is it to think about right the historical harms and what has happened in these plants ultimately where they're going to have to deploy that should be a bar a part of customer discovery it's not right now you go to any accelerator incubator mainly they're not talking about that right so I have companies coming to me and saying hey I did an initial social impact or equity analysis where do I go after this I didn't have anywhere to put put them towards right and so I think that's the problem it's like well where can you actually go to build more holistic technologies and products and companies a lot of it doesn't exist in my opinion I do think there's a role for government there's a role for universities as I mentioned there's a role for private investment but we have to start there because then we're going to keep seeing what you're what you're alluding to okay we are out of time that was a great note to end on thank you to this this amazing panel this was a great discussion yeah.